We are changing gears, uh, talking about the forgotten gender. And um, this uh, New Yorker cat, uh, cartoon I love. So this is the lady of the house. And you see how straight her back is? <laughs> and she's measuring this person who I assume is her husband. Uh, and you see how he's getting older and smaller. He looks happy, though. Yeah, I know. She looks really happy. <laughs> <laughs> If I, I have a joke to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you. Say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's our Letterman Top Ten. We're going to talk about uh, these uh, issues with regard to uh, male osteoporosis. So first, how common is, and I've shown <laughs> you this slide before, <clears throat> in the U.S., and it varies by country, but one quarter of the country's osteoporotic slash osteopenic population uh, is men. And that figure is some, I don't know, some figure, 10 million to 12 million uh, men. Certainly not as much as women, but not in any way trivial. This is a big problem. I see a lot of men with osteoporosis, a lot of men. And it's very expensive, as this disease is. Uh, <clears throat> of the two, $17 billion um, estimated, um, one quarter or maybe a little bit more of that expense is uh, related to male osteoporosis. These uh, are European studies uh, looking at the prevalence, not the incidence, but the prevalence of vertebral fracture uh, as a function of age, male versus female. <clears throat> and you'll notice there are, there's a greater prevalence of vertebral fractures in men than in women. And then thereafter, the women, um, of course, have more. So one interesting question is why, um, why do you see more greater prevalence of vertebral fractures in the younger group um, in men than in women? I'm sorry, not getting. More likely to perform risky behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So w when they were 20 or 15, they were falling out of trees. So behavior is um, is uh, the, the explanation. So young men take risks that women perhaps don't, and maybe this is all traumatic. Maybe this is not related to the um, the discussion of osteoporosis. Looking at fractures as a function of age, <clears throat> um, in uh, some interesting points about this. First, the forearm fracture, the Colley's fracture, doesn't seem to uh, show an increase with age, while in women it sort of does. In the spine, there are both, for both men and women, there's a rather exponential increase in the vertebral compression fracture, but men are displaced in time by about 10, 5, 10 years. And similarly, in terms of the hip fracture, the uptick in men occurs, but um, with a time displacement of 5 or 10 years. The men, when they have their hip fracture, they're older, and they have much greater mortality. This is a 26 or so percent figure of mortal increased mortality versus women. And again, this may speak to the older population. Maybe there are more comorbidities among the men uh, than there are women because they're older. And that may help to explain why um, mortality figures are greater. Okay, so let's take uh, Letterman 9. Uh, do men achieve greater peak bone mass than women? What is the difference between aerial and volumetric density measurements? <clears throat> well, if you look at bone mass, men have accrue more bone mass than women. And at peak bone mass, whatever that age is, 25 to 30, um, there's about a 7 to 10 percent increase in total bone mass, men versus women. <clears throat> and then with aging, there is the age-related decline, 
um, with the perhaps the greater change in the women in the early menopausal years. But age-related bone loss occurs in both sexes. Sex steroid-related bone loss occurs naturally only in women, but it occurs in men under conditions of the development of hypogonadism or ADT therapy. In both cases, hypogonadism will lead to the same accelerated bone loss in men as, it, as it, we see regularly in uh, postmenopausal women. Now, we want to make a distinction, and we haven't done this a lot in the past two weeks, <coughs> between aerial bone density and volumetric bone density. Aerial bone density is what we get with DEXA. Um, we get grams per centimeter squared. Um, it is heavily dependent on area. The bigger the bone, the greater the bone density. Volumetric density is the three dimensions. That's true bone density. <coughs> and that's grams per cubic centimeter of space. Now, if you look at aerial bone density, and this goes to the pediatrics, um, you see what you would expect. Aerial bone density goes up during puberty in men, men, boys. How do you refer to 13-year-old boys? Do you hear them? Boys? What are they? Boys? Okay. <laughs> You don't refer to them as males, do you? Boys. Okay. Thirteen-year-old boys and thirteen-year-old girls. They, the girls are earlier because their menarche is earlier. And so you see the improvement. And, and, yet, and, and you see men gaining greater aerial bone density than the girls. We all know that. Now, what we don't know is whether this obtains when you look at volumetric bone density. This is aerial bone density. If you look at volumetric bone density, you don't see any difference. And if, uh, <coughs> you, excuse me, you, you don't see any, you don't even see that pubertal uh, increase. Volumetric density seems to be a constant over time. And there really isn't very much of a difference between males and females when it comes to volumetric bone density. Okay, let me move on. How important are androgens and estrogens in establishing peak bone mass and in protecting men from bone loss? Uh, attributed to androgens, greater peak bone mass, more prolonged maintenance of bone mass because there is no um, expected male menopause. <laughs> There's greater muscle mass, which we think is an androgen effect. The Mr. Oz study, which is the big epidemiological equivalent of the study of osteoporotic fractures, the Mr. Oz study has suggested that the fact that men fall less frequently than women may be an androgen effect. And as I mentioned before, there's greater cross-sectional area at peak bone mass, and we know that bone cross-sectional area is a marker of bone strength. The bigger the bone, the stronger the bone, and the greater surface area of, uh, through which you can diffuse a mechanical stress. So I don't want to minimize aerial bone density. <clears throat> In fact, the DEXA machine, again, unwittingly, is a wonderful measurement, and it takes into account aerial bone density. <clears throat> and this is the um, cartoon that indicates the greater cross-sectional area with aging. It's probably a compensatory mechanism to the cortical thinning that occurs with aging. <clears throat> but you can see that the men seem to accommodate to a greater extent than do women this thinning of the cortex by increasing their cross-sectional area. Okay. <clears throat> now, going back to um, high school or college or medical school or wherever you learn this, um, this is a fact of life. There is no way the human body can make estrogens without starting with androgens. <clears throat> 
That's it. Statement, true, 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 always. So here is the pathway <coughs> by which we make androgens and estrogens. We start with cholesterol. We go down one pathway and we get to estrone. We go down another pathway. We get to estradiol. In each case, the precursor is an androgen, androstenedione or testosterone. And in each, in each case, there is an enzyme, the same enzyme, called aromatase. And the aromatase inhibitors, of course, have become you know, very important in the treatment of women who are, are uh, in need of this therapy because it literally wipes out estrogen. You have a postmenopausal woman <coughs> who has an estrogen level of a little bit because they make estrogen from, from fat, um, primarily in the postmenopausal state. And the aromatase inhibitors goes from five to zero. It's amazing. Okay. So, here is the thought experiment. If you had a man who was born without aromatase, you would have a man without estrogen. Do such men exist? And what would their bones look like? Well, there is uh, one male in the world who was born with a defect of the estrogen receptor. So he has estrogen, but he doesn't, doesn't have a receptor. Uh, and there are seven men in the world who we know about who were born with an aromatase gene mutation. <coughs> Androgen levels in both cases are elevated. <clears throat> in the aromatase deficient examples, there no, there's no estrogen. Um, in the case of the estrogen receptor, um, there's estrogen, but it's not effective. And in these two models, bone density is low. So, this is a man that I took care of. <clears throat> um, he's a man, right? obviously a man. Um, you can't appreciate the fact that he's seven feet tall and he was still growing at the age of 28. His epiphyses were open and he had a bone age of 15. He has a little bit of a unicoid hapidus. How did we find this man? We knew about his sister who was born with ambiguous genitalia. And she had aromatase deficiency. <clears throat> and Carrie Morishima, who was one of our great pediatric endocrinologists, um, was thinking about maybe the brother has the same thing. And he went and found this man who was working in New Jersey, and we worked him up. <clears throat> and here is what we found. His three androgen levels I'm showing you um, are shown in the orange, the range, <clears throat> with the normal range in black. And you can see that his three androgen levels, androstene, diotestosterone, 5 alpha dihydro, were high. His testosterone level was two, over 2,000 nanograms per deciliter. No man needs that amount of testosterone. <clears throat> and look at his estrogen levels, none. He had no detectable estrone or estradiol. And his gonadotrophs were in the mild um, castrate range, despite the fact that his androgen levels were super high. So for us endocrinologists, this actually makes a very interesting point. What controls the gonadotrophs in a man? Okay. His bone density corrected from bone size was low, <clears throat> minus two by Z score. T score doesn't matter at the age of 28. Uh, lumbar spine, femoral neck, and his radial bone density was really low. And I don't really understand why his radial density would have been so low, but it, what it was. So, what would you do? And by the way, he has a gene defect. We've, we've identified the gene. <clears throat> and this paper um, was published in the um, New England Journal oh, about 20 years ago.
it was one of the, it was actually the first case of pure aromatase deficiency. There had been a previous man who had a partial hypopituitarism and it was a little bit messy, but this, this man had pure aromatase deficiency. So um, um, what would you do with this man? What would you treat him with? Of course. <clears throat> so we did. And uh, Kerry was um, taking care of him and then he asked me to take over and I wrote a, we gave him conjugated estrogen and I wrote the prescription and uh, I get a call from the pharmacist. <laughs> this is many years ago now. These days, big deal, you know. <laughs> but in those days, ooh, the pharmacist called me and said, uh, a doctor, I see this prescription. <laughs> Uh, this is for Mr. X, and I said, yes, for Mr. X, and he says, um, this is estrogen. I said, yeah, I know. He says, is, are you sure this is right? And I said, yes, I can't get into the details, but uh, please fulfill, <laughs> fulfill this prescription. He said, okay, but I don't like this. <laughs> he took estrogen. He did beautifully. Um, um, his, uh, you can see his bone density f uh, changing remarkably over five years at all sites. Um, other things that happened to him. His epiphyses immediately closed. He is still seven feet. His gonadotrophs normalized. Makes a fabulous point that we knew about from rat studies, but nobody ever really understood. But the real, the controlling sex steroid in men, just like in women, is estrogen, not, not androgens. Um, and he's done very, very well. He had no as you would expect, no psychosocial issues. I mean, he had no estrogen, not like we were giving him more estrogen than he needed. We gave him enough to give his, get his levels up to normal for a male. And uh, so, this was what we call a prismatic case. And why I want to make this point is that, you know, I've told you, you've heard all about these fancy clinical trials that have led to um, these wonderful drugs. 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 17,000 people. Sometimes it takes one case to uh, open a whole field. One case well studied. And that's what we call prismatic cases. And the, our field, endocrinology, is le legendary for this. But don't forget, you may be about to see in your next clinic patient, a patient who's going to open a a new vista of knowledge. And this man and the other men who followed him have given us tremendous insight into the um, roles of estrogen and, uh, and androgen in male skeletal health. So, growth stops, epiphyses closed, bone density improved, his unicoid habitus abated. He had a little bit of a metabolic syndrome uh, which has also been associated with estrogen deficiency in men. That abated, and he had no psychosocial issues. So, and the importance of estrogen to male skeletal health, uh, optimal peak bone mass, linear bone growth, um, puberty gro pubertal growth spurt, um, and also epiphyseal maturation are all important. And also, the maintenance of bone mass. Um, the age-related decline in male skeletal mass is much more directly related to the age-related decline in estrogen than it is to the age-related decline in androgen. This has been well established in many, many studies. So it isn't just the accrual of bone mass, the maintenance of bone mass, um, it's all phases uh, in the male require estrogen for optimal effects. So, not to minimize androgen, of course androgens are important too. So, if you look at the Mr. Oz study, and you look at the lowest quartile for free estrogen, or fresh estradiol, and the lowest quartile for free testosterone in the back left, the hazard ratio for fracture is the highest. Um, if you have reduced LE2 or reduced T, you have an increased hazard ratio, um, but not as great as you would have if your E2 and T are low. So clearly, both estrogen and androgens are important uh, for the achievement of peak bone mass in men.
<clears throat> so we're going to pick up 8A. Are there microarchitectural differences between the male and the female skeleton? And is it a function of, <laughs> at peak bone mass and with aging? This work comes from the Mayo Clinic with Sandeep Kosla, looking at HRPQCT in a cross-sectional view of the aging uh, female and male skeleton. <clears throat> and what um, Sandeep showed was that at peak bone mass, men versus women, the trabeculae are uh, significantly thicker um, than in men than in women, and the total bone volume over tissue volume is greater in men than in women. But there is no difference in trabecular number. And then when you look at this cross-sectionally with aging, it's, it's interesting that trabecular number in men goes up a little bit, trabecular separation goes down a little bit. So they maintain their microstructure pretty well. Tissue, TBV over TV, goes down in both, and trabecular thickness seems to drop in both. But trabecular number and trabecular separation is much different in the aging female skeleton than in the uh, male. And it's, this seems to suggest that with estrogen deficiency, you have a greater tendency uh, to have those trabeculae drop out as opposed to the male where they tend to thin. So you maintain your trabecular structure. They are thinner trabeculae, but they're not dropping out. While in the woman, the female, um, the number is dropping, separation is increasing. Uh, they're just not maintaining their structure, although there is also some thinning. <clears throat> so with women, trabeculae are lost and become thin. But in men, the trabeculae become thin but are not lost. So there's a really a difference in this the age-related changes in microstructure, uh, women versus men. Okay. How do we diagnose osteoporosis in men? It may seem like a simple question, but it isn't. <clears throat> we all know this truth, that for every standard deviation reduction in bone density, fracture risk is double. This is all from the original data were from women. And the question came up, what about men? <clears throat> and it turns out that it's the same. So men, women, we have the same proportionality. Um, so that's good news. We don't have to say men are more or less at risk in terms of changes in their bone density. <clears throat> This cut point of minus 2.5, does this relate to men? Do the men have the same lifetime risk of fracture at a T-score of minus 2.5 uh, as women do? And furthermore, um, what database do we use to establish a T-score in men versus women? <coughs> There are two ways of looking at this. Uh, you can say that fracture risk is related to absolute bone density, grams per centimeter squared. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. If you're at 0.7 grams per centimeter squared, you have the same risk of fracture. It has nothing to do with your gender. It has to do with your absolute bone density. And there are data from the, Rotter, the Rotterdam study, and this is uh, an example, where at absolute bone density, femoral neck, grams per centimeter squared, um, whatever it is and whatever age the person's at, the risk is exactly the same men versus women. That is interesting, and it suggests that maybe we shouldn't be using men as the database. We should use women. We use a single gender, non-specific, well, be women because we have all the data for women. We should relate the male to the female database because of this point. If we relate it to the male database, we'd have a different T-score because the male database is going to be a bigger database. 
you, you have a higher bone density. So the, the, if you compare it to the woman, the bone density is going to look better because the male will start with more bone density. Um, so that is the argument. And if you did that, applying um, the female database to both genders, you would, as you would expect, see fewer men with osteoporosis because for their bone density is going to be higher and relating it to the male, female database, their T-score is going to be better. So you would have a much lower percentage of men with osteoporosis based upon uh, this uh, thinking. Uh, and that's not true. Not true. We, we see much more osteoporosis than 12%. So the other argument is that, no, you got to go male-male. Uh, male, males, men need more bone because they're bigger people. And so you need to relate their relative risk of fracture to their own database, not to the female database. And in, to a certain extent, this is true. Um, the uh, fractures occur in men at a higher bone density than women, <coughs> but, their, but their absolute fracture risk is much lower. So now we're talking about absolute fracture risk versus relative fracture risk. If you go to the male-specific database, then you have a demographic that's much more consistent with the epidemiological data. It's about one quarter if you go male to male. So what do we do? The International Society for Clinical Densitometry and the Endocrine Society have recommended up until recently the male database um, and the T-score of minus 2.5. But the ISCD a few years ago changed its recommendation to get everybody bollocksed up and said you could use either the male or the female database. <clears throat> um, so we really haven't settled it. The reason why the, um, the, the proponents of the single gender database are winning the, the battle is because when you look at FRAX, FRAX is an absolute scale not a relative scale. If a T-score of minus 2.5 in a, with a male database means there's a 2.5-fold relative risk, that is true. But absolute risk is very different in the male. So if you're using FRAX, which needs an absolute scale, you probably ought to use the female database. And the FRAX score is actually using the female database. So you can play with this when you go to your FRAX Gizmo, um, you can you will you can you will notice that um, it's a single database, single female database. The Institute of the uh, is, um, the International Osteoporosis Foundation has gone to this. Frax has gone to this, and now the uh, ISCD says, uh, you know, use either. Why is it then that we have to put in what machine it's on if it's an absolute grams per centimeter squared? It's different. It's different because the um, the old, so the um, the femoral neck is the only uh, reference point which is shared by all machines. If you, if you put the femoral neck T score in, you'll have the same. The femoral neck absolute bone density, whole logic, um, GE lunar or Norlin will give you the same T score. But if you put the lumbar spine absolute bone density, it varies. Total hip, it varies. Distal radius, it varies. Because their own databases are different. But the femoral neck is the same. And the femoral neck is based on the NHANES 3 data. Now, is this a tempest in the teapot? If you go back to what we started with, how do you diagnose this disease? If you rely on the T-score, yeah, there's a problem. But we have expanded our diagnosis to the fragility fracture, which should have been a no-brainer, but now we have to talk about it, and the FRAX guidelines. So if you encompass all of these ways of assessing risk, then it probably doesn't matter whether you use the male or the female database. You're going to get the same data at the end. But it is an active discussion. Okay, let's move on. Um, when should men have a bone density test? 
We know about women. The um, CMS Medicare Bone Mass Measurement Act says all women are entitled to a bone density at the age of 65. We don't have such mandates in men, but most of the societies are saying 70 years or older. And um, uh, we do it, um, and usually there's not a problem with regard to uh, coverage. <clears throat> and like women, um, but younger than 65, men younger than 70, um, we have another set of indications for doing uh, bone density. Uh, prior fracture at the age of, over the age of 50. If you find a vertebral deformity, um, uh, yes. And then a whole host of other diseases or conditions in which um, you could be and should be thinking of, about getting a bone density test. And the, this list is not different from, from women. Okay. Um, so what do we measure? Uh, lumbar spine and hip, that's the official recommendation of the Endocrine Society. And the distal third radius, only if one of the following conditions exist. Uh, if you can't measure one site accurately, if somebody has severe uh, scoliosis, um, osteoarthritis, they've had a hip replacement, what have you. Um, hyperpara is, of course, you must do uh, distal radial bone density with hyperparathyroidism. And the third is interesting, AD ADT therapy, which is kind of interesting because I would have expected you to have more lumbar spine reduction. But again, men have, the, the vertebral spine of men as they get older is very difficult to measure because there's so much sclerosis and often there's an artifact. But there is a specific indication for ADT therapy uh, in men to measure the distal third radius. And as you know, my bias is I think everybody should have the distal third measured. But the official recommendations of the Endocrine Society are to measure the radius um, only under these uh, conditions. Um, by the way, um, um, you don't get paid extra for a distal third radial bone density. Um, and um, high volume centers, there are no more high volume bone density centers um, because reimbursement is so poor. But, the, the, you know, I don't care whether I get paid. I want to do the right thing. So we do this little third, and we, it's just incorporated into the bone density test. Okay, risk factors for men. Um, nothing very special here. You've seen this kind of list before. It's exactly the same uh, as in women. There's just nothing uh, that's, that falls out as something peculiar to, to men versus women. <clears throat> the major causes, the big three, alcoholism, glucocorticoid use, obviously not Cushing's disease, <clears throat> that's a rare disease, and hypogonadism. They, they constitute about half of the men you'll see with osteoporosis. Um, about half, or a little less than half, you won't, you'll do the workup and you won't find anything. <clears throat> and then there's a smattering of a big differential diagnosis uh, that can lead to osteoporosis. Alcoholism is a very difficult diagnosis to make. Um, d do you drink alcohol? And the answer is, no doctor, I don't drink alcohol. 95% of my patients don't drink alcohol. That's not possible. So it, it's, and when you get to alcoholism, it's a disease of denial. So to find out whether somebody is an alcoholic, it requires a fair amount of sophistication and sleuthing and talking to family members if you suspect it. Uh, similarly, hypogonadism, it's not easy to make that diagnosis. In the male, the grown-up male, you often don't see anything on physical exam. You may not get anything in terms of a history of libido or what have you. Um, and uh, so, the only way you can make a diagnosis of hypogonadism in men is to measure <laughs> testosterone in the gonadotrophins. If you don't measure it, you, you will miss the diagnosis, I promise you. That's why you must, in the workup, you must include androgens um, and gonadotrophs 
even if you don't think there's any possibility the patient has hypogonadism, the patient may. Don't forget the big three. Very important. And here are uh, many other causes. Gastrointestinal, this isn't very different from women. Um, this, uh, occult celiac disease, we, you know, we sort of overstated that point to make the point. People who don't have overt symptomatology uh, may well have celiac disease. And um, to be very complete, you'll do the serologies and rule it out. Hypercalcuria was said to be a more common cause of osteoporosis in men in some of the earlier studies. As many as 10% of men uh, had a primary hypercalcuria. I don't really see it that often. Um, Anticonvulsants, thyrotoxicosis, hyperpara, <clears throat> any other diseases you see here. Uh, and again, you're not going to rule out all these diseases. It, it's a matter of what you think is needed to be, work, uh, to be ruled out. Uh, and it depends on the patient. So what is the appropriate evaluation? Well, obviously, the biochemistries, vertebral x-rays if indicated. If the patient has lost height, you may start with a VFA. If you can see a compression fracture, if it's equivocal, you might get straight x-rays. <clears throat> um, always measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, I always measure PTH, of course. Um, can you imagine somebody seeing me and leaving <laughs> my office without a PTA? They would never come back. <laughs> hey, doctor, what is this? But uh, there's some discussion about whether you should wait on the PTH. Urinary calcium should be done, and most of us believe a 24-hour urine is the best way of getting a, a collection. It's a, it is a problem. A patient has to kind of carve out a day where um, she or he has access to a jug. Um, I like bone turnover markers. Controversial, but I think they're helpful to give a state of what kind of, what is the bone metabolism of that uh, patient. <coughs> Testosterone, for sure. <clears throat> now, estrogens, um, you're not going to find the eighth man in the world with aromatase division. I promise you, you will not find this person. So why measure estrogen? There really isn't a good reason except for the following. And no one has really um, nailed this down yet. <clears throat> But there are polymorphisms of that aromatase gene. Uh, Luigi Gennari uh, from uh, Siena, Italy, uh, has published on this. Uh, and these uh, polymorphisms, they're satellite um, uh, abnormalities, not abnormalities, they're, they're polymorphism. Some of these satellites um, uh, um, markers are associated with a disproportionate reduction. You expect a certain amount of estradiol for a certain amount of testosterone. And some of these polymorphisms are associated with a disproportionate reduction in what you would expect to be an estrogen level. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that these polymorphic um, variants um, are causative in the male who has osteoporosis, but it is interesting. So you might measure just for curiosity. Um, I, I'm not going to say anything more about it, but it is of interest. And the gonadotrophs, <clears throat> um, you might start with the testosterone and the gonadotrophs, or depending on how efficient you are, you may lump them all together. Um, because if the testosterone is low, you're obviously going to have to get gonadotrophins. And then cortisol, thyroid hormone, protein, PEP, gluten antibodies, small bowel biopsy. Um, again, we always get thyroid hormone. I always get a PEP. I like to get cortisol because you, you can see occult Cushing's disease, and people are not overtly Cushingoid. Um, gluten antibodies are easy to get, so that seems reasonable. And of course, not a small bowel biopsy unless, you, unless it's really indicated. So it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Non-pharmacological approaches, nothing special here. <clears throat> it's not, um, not different from the, what we advise for women. Um, and uh, pharmacological agents, um, you know, fracture, obviously makes you um, uh, in the pharmacological world. Um, bone density pushes you in that direction. Frax pushes you in that direction. <clears throat> and the American Society of Rheumatology guidelines, which we aren't going to go over, they're too complicated. Hopefully when they come up with their new guidelines in two months, we'll be able to understand them. Um, but again, glucocorticoids 
uh, may well be an indication for treatment as a, as a prophylaxis against expected bone loss in someone who's going to be on long-term um, glucocorticoid therapy. <clears throat> High-risk patients we treat. Intermediate patients we use FRACs. And then uh, the treatments are following. Androgens. This is an interesting um, discussion. Um, if you use testosterone in hypogonadal men, you will show an increase in lumbar spine bone density and in the hip. I think that's pretty clear. What is not clear is whether there is a reduction in fracture risk. And you may say, well, you're being too much of a purist. Bone density is going up. Of course, fracture risk is going down. You could say that. But the data are not there. <clears throat> and um, with regard to that increase in bone density at the lumbar spine, you'll notice this is work from Peter Snyder. When you get to levels of testosterone that are clearly not hypogonadal, 400 and even 300, um, you lose the effect of testosterone on bone density. Well, that makes an obvious point. To use testosterone only in men who are hypogonadal. To use testosterone in men who are not hypogonadal, there's no point whatsoever um, particularly with regard to expecting there to be a change in bone density. With due regard to the adverse events associated with androgen therapy, <coughs> PSA, erythrocytosis, sleep apnea, the prostate you have to worry about, lipids you have to worry about, behavioral changes may be. Now, so it's not just you know, deciding to use testosterone, even in someone who's hypogonadal. And with particular reference to the treatment of osteoporosis, <clears throat> the Endocrine Society has come out, and I was part of the guidelines committee, that if you have a man who's hypogonadal and is not symptomatic of hypogonadism, the treatment is not testosterone. The treatment is one of the approved therapies for osteoporosis. <clears throat> if the patient is symptomatic of hypogonadism and you are not worried about treating such a patient, in terms of the side effects, <clears throat> then of course you'll use um, replacement therapy. But you won't use replacement therapy as a treatment for osteoporosis. You'll use it as replacement therapy. And you will use one of the approved therapies for osteoporosis as well. So that is all of what we're, this, this um, uh, slide shows. <clears throat> and it's a little confusing, but it seems to make sense. And um, um, I think we all subscribe to it. In a, uh, the, the third bullet is um, a very special situation. If you can't use an approved pharmacological agent um, and the patient's hypogonadal, then of course you use testosterone. But that's a, now that we have so many drugs available, I think that would be um, unlikely. <clears throat> okay, so here are the approved drugs for male osteoporosis. Um, worldwide, strontium is approved, but not in this country. DMAB is approved, alendronate, resedronate, zoledronic acid, and teriparatide, all approved for the treatment of osteoporosis. So there's nothing special here. By the way, these approvals, of course, came later because the male studies have always come after the female studies. The male studies have always been imperfect. They have used a much smaller number of men. And the endpoints have not been fractured, except for a few exceptions. The endpoints have been to increase bone density. So the indications by the FDA for these approved treatments are to improve bone density, not to reduce fracture incidence, because the data are not secure, except in a, a few issues and one uh, instances. And one is the uh, paper that relates to uh, fracture risk with uh, zoledronic acid. <clears throat> and this was a study that had an, as an endpoint um, fracture 
risk reduction. Uh, this was a two-year placebo-controlled study with a fair number of men. Uh, 1,200 is a lot of men for a study like this. Uh, and um, uh, it could be primary osteoporosis or it could be secondary to hypogonadism. <clears throat> the primary endpoint was morphometric vertebral fractures. And you can see the absolute fra reduction was a lot and the relative risk reduction was 67%. <clears throat> and this was the first clinical trial in men with fracture being an endpoint. And you can see at the one year point as well as at the two year point, there clearly was a reduction in uh, vertebral fracture incidence in comparison to um, the placebo group. Um, more recently, and this has not been published yet as a full length paper, but there is an experience now with DMAB um, <clears throat> in the treatment of men with low bone density, a 24 month study. Um, you can see that um, there was a placebo group and then, <coughs> and then like the Freedom study, in this case after one year, there was a switch over from the placebo group to DMAB. The group that got DMAB after one year continued on DMAB for the second year. And again, the endpoint was bone density, not fracture uh, risk. <clears throat> and uh, again, you've seen this kind of uh, slide before. This was now the male showing very similar um, uh, increase over only a two-year period. 8% um, over two years at the lumbar spine, 3.4%. So, and then, then the crossover group you saw uh, the increase. So again, very similar. And the good news is that most of the studies with men have mimicked the experience with women. So really haven't been surprised uh, by the data insofar as we have them. <clears throat> um, this is um, the, um, again, the uh, radial bone density you can see. Um, it does go up, as you know now, uh, for, the, for the women in the bottom panel. And these other areas of the hip are showing, again, not an unexpectedly uh, increases. <clears throat> there is um, a rapid um, reduction in bone turnover when you switch from placebo to um, uh, open-label denosumab. There is a rapid reduction when you start denosumab. All of this is very, very, um, if not identical, very similar to the, uh, to the female data. So we have uh, an indication with denosumab for men to increase bone density. Um, and again, it's just reiterating what you all know. <coughs> um, the story with parathyroid hormone, <coughs> there is um, a little bit of a data suggesting that P uh, teriparatide reduces fracture, um, vertebral fracture incidence in men um, with a relative risk reduction of 0.5 in terms of all fractures um, a little bit less robust in terms of moderate and uh, severe fractures. So what agent to use? We have almost the same menu in men as we do in women. Um, men at high risk for fracture, we have the bisphosphonates, we have teriparatide. And again, it's a matter of your experience, what you know, what you're comfortable with, what your patient will accept. You have to put your patient into the equation. Doctor, I'm not going to take that medicine. I don't care what you say, okay? So you say, I have another great medicine for you. <laughs> <clears throat> and with zoledronic acid, because of the data I showed you earlier, it seems like if a patient has had a recent hip fracture, um, it seems like Zol is the, the preferred treatment. <clears throat> monitoring, similar for uh, women, um, <coughs> monitoring with DEXA every two years. Um, this is a very conservative approach. I, I like to monitor bone density on a yearly basis. I, I, I subscribe to the notion of the least significant change. I understand what least significant change is. I know that because of the precision of DEXA instrumentation, <coughs> you almost never get to a least significant change uh, barrier above that or below that in a year. I understand all that. On the other hand, if you get another point on your curve, one year, two years, three years, four years, you really begin to see things as opposed to every 23 months. <clears throat> there are barriers to doing bone density every year. The barriers are restrictions to reimbursement. But again, if you explain to your patient it's gonna cost them $63 out of pocket, <clears throat> most patients would like to see those data even though they're gonna to have to pay a little bit more. So you have to have a discussion with them 
that they might have to pay. If they refuse to pay, okay, you won't do it. <clears throat> and then bone turnover markers um, are, this is from the Endocrine Society um, for anti-resorptives. They're suggesting a anti-resorptive marker. For anabolic therapy, they're suggesting a bone formation marker. <clears throat> So the reason why I'm showing you this picture is not because he likes the New York Knickerbockers. He is a big Knickerbocker fan. Uh, uh, but uh, to, just to make the point, uh, he was part of the uh, milk mustache um, advertising campaign. The point to make is that this is a disease that affects everyone. It affects men as well as women. It affects anybody from any racial background, any ethnic background. Um, this is a disease for all of us to worry about, and it is not a privy of Caucasians or otherwise. So, you know, it is universally uh, an issue. <clears throat> so it's a big disease, and we have spent a lot of time talking about it, and we will spend a lot of time taking care of patients with this disease. And I think that uh, as we learn more about this disease, we'll be in better, um, we'll be situated in a better way to deal with it. <clears throat>